heard about you know the education system falling apart in Tamil Nadu and elsewhere. Uh, we talk about uh, the BBC attacks on Modi ji, things like that. But we haven't really looked at what are the deep causes for these kinds of attacks that come sporadically, that catch us unaware and unprepared to even give a response. So the snakes in the Ganga essentially is a work that is in four parts. There are many new insights that we bring out in the book. It's a painstaking work where we show um, a lot of reference and background. We are not making ad hominem attacks. And so there is also a story behind the making of the snakes in the Ganga as well. But I would start off saying that Western universalism as we know it has been coming to India, being applied on our social structure through different forms of Western theories that emanate from social sciences. Uh, Rajiv ji has talked about the five waves of Indology in the past. We're starting from Marxism and on and on to you know post-colonial studies and uh, post-modernism, subaltern studies, things like that. Now, after these five waves of Indology that Rajiv ji has talked about, there is a sixth wave. And that sort of is the foundation upon which the snakes in the Ganga uh, essentially rests on. So this fifth, sixth wave of Indology, so to speak, is something called critical caste theory. Now, one might wonder why should we bother about these social theories, but very soon you will understand by the time I finish that uh, it's very important to understand Western social sciences because they are being constantly applied to us and it destroys society, it becomes a breaking India force and we are always reacting to these forces. I think 12 or 13 years ago, uh, Rajiv ji wrote the first book, Breaking India. It is still relevant. Uh, we see the missionary and the church uh, still at play. Uh, Aravinda Nilakantan was, uh, you know, the co-author then. And Breaking India 2.0, which is Snakes and the Ganga, is also the, has the same mission of Breaking India. But the players have changed, the funders have changed, the means have changed, and there is a force multiplier of sorts. And we really need to look at this as a, a, a really, uh, a, a, a very critical uh, point in the civilizational history of India because there is no turning back after this. Now we call ourselves uh, Vishwa Guru, uh, you know, all of uh, Subramanya Bharati's work uh, tells us that we perhaps were Vishwa Guru at one point. I would say Mahakavi Bharati would be extremely disappointed with all of us looking at the state, uh, especially after you look at this civilizational audit that we have presented in the book. Now, so I want to quickly get into critical race theory and how it has come into India as critical caste theory, where race is being equated to caste and the effects of that on the ground. Now, as with any Marxist theory, uh, the, the, it is all about uh, power in society. The Americans essentially saw that different racial groups had different outcomes in various domains, in, you know, had a disparate, uneven outcome even after the civil rights movement, which essentially, they said, means that racism is deliberately woven into the, into the society. So outcome of different racial groups in various domains in, is, dis, is disparate, even after the civil rights movement, and so what should we do about it? So they decided this small group of people uh, this began in uh, in the legal uh, uh, in harvard actually in the law school 
where they said that they came up with this critical race theory where they said that the reason why we have different outcomes even though we've tried to accommodate and make equal rights and access uh, to the marginalized communities which is essentially the blacks of America there still seems to be a problem where the marginalized community is not doing well and therefore they decide that the reason for this is that the very DNA of social structures is racist. So what happens is they say that American society is fundamentally racist without recourse and it's caused by white people who have white privilege. So they say that the white people who have privilege have designed these systems and institutions and society in such a way that whatever the blacks do, they can never come up. And hence, the answer to this essentially is that we dismantle the existing systems as they stand because every incremental improvement for the blacks is not good enough. They are never going to get ahead because the system inherently in its very DNA is biased and is set up to ensure that the blacks fail. This obviously is not true because you know how many Indians are there that are doing extremely well in that very same system. So it's not fair to take a broad brush like that and say that the entire American system is uh, you know, stacked up against the, uh, the minorities and it's st structured in a way that privileges only white folks. And that's obviously not true in the results that we see. All of us have family, families over, overseas and they all seem to be doing well in that system. Yes, there could be problems with bias um, here and there and that could be addressed separately, but it is unfair to say that the entire American system is structurally biased and therefore needs to be dismantled. Now, now what has happened is that this critical race theory, which is saying that the system in, in fact is biased, says also that there are solutions, which is we dismantle the society and we come up with ways to ensure that there is equality of outcome and not equality of opportunity. So what they try to say is that when you give equality of opportunity, everybody is given equal opportunity. So maybe you have affirmative action and in India you have um, quotas and all of that. So you're making, you're leveling the playing field. But that's somehow not good enough because at the end of it, there are some people that are doing better. So they are getting better scores, they're getting better jobs, all of that. And so the outcome is not equal. And how do we make the outcome equal? So, we, so they say that the system itself is biased and we need to dismantle. Now how do they go about doing the dismantling? For example, if you look at American universities now, they say it's uh, test optional. In the sense they're doing away with um, entrance examinations altogether. So this is how the standards are being lowered. and. This is to ensure that the outcome is the same. Gone are the days uh, that we are looking for equal opportunity and making sure everybody gets a fair chance. Now we, the talk is how do we make everybody have the same outcome and if they don't have the same outcome it means we take it from one person. This is a redistribution of resources. So you take it from one person and give it to someone else to make sure that the outcome is the same. And so this has far-reaching consequences um, within society. Now, critical race, uh, you know, uh, claims, uh, critical race theory claims that the privileged class, so be it Brahmins, men, whites, heterosexuals, have conspired to create structures in society that ensure their success is guaranteed. So. In, in Indian, in this case of India, when it becomes critical caste theory, you have the Savarna or the upper caste are scapegoated in Indian societies because they are considered to be the whites of uh, Indian society. In Breaking India 1.0, um, Rajiv ji had talked about the Afro Dalit project. Uh, it was just starting then, 13 years ago, and now it's come full fledged into this critical caste theory because we really haven't done anything about that and it is and I'll show you examples of how it's entered uh, Indian society uh, with dangerous consequences. So 
the um, so they say that every white person is a born oppressor which means in in, in the indian context every uh, brahmin is a born oppressor regardless of what you did or did not do the very fact that you were born as a brahmin so they use caste in this sort of surreal you know different sense um and they the um there is no free speech they essentially want to silence anyone if you stand up and say actually that's not fair i i'm i may be a white or a brahmin but i have really haven't done anything bad you really have no chance to speak out because the very fact that you are you know from that background a privileged background you have um, you, you know you you essentially don't get air time and you're cancelled your views don't matter the lived experience of the marginalized is what um, gets currency now what happens in america now is that it makes a society extremely divisive um, it turns it into oppressor and oppressed it it uh, it uh, glorifies victimhood so everybody wants to be the victim and this this critical race theory has moved into other areas of gender um where uh, you know the women are saying that you know patriarchy is essentially defining what is normal so they're fighting family um the family is another structure that is um uh, you know that is passing on these kinds of ideas of um of patriarchy and hegemony from one generation to another so we need to break the family and and of course there is this whole debate on on gender itself the idea of gender itself is patriarchy who is to say who's a man and who's a woman i can be a woman in the morning and man in the night and these are something that society has imposed and these structures also need to be broken and so so what has happened is this critical race theory has come into india and we say in the book that the people who are funding these are unfortunately the indian billionaires now where do where does this come um, where does this th- critical race theory become critical caste theory where does it originate harvard university we say is the nest of snakes and in harvard we uh, we look at um, you know three scholars and one activist so we look at suraj yengade we look at um, ajanta subramaniam who wants to dismantle the iits and then we also look at uh, tenmuri soundarajan and another black uh, scholar by the name of isabel wilkerson and we give rejoinders to what they have to say um, so suraj yengade is a dalit scholar who is a fellow at harvard university he is meticulously mapping uh the uh, african american uh life and and activism into the dalit um uh, life and dalit activism so you have benign things like uh, uh, dalit history month which mirrors the uh, which mirrors the Af- uh, black history month and you have black lives matter um and you now you have dalit lives matter black lives matter now is not considered uh, such a benign group anymore in the us um because of their links to antifa and other sort of local domestic terrorist organizations you also have dalit uh, panthers which mirrors the black panthers black panthers are known to be a terrorist organization in the us now suraj yengade then goes on to telling in indian kids whose parents have paid a quarter million dollars for an ivy league education saying how you should sever ties with your parents because they are passing on these casteist ideas from one generation and to to the other and the only way you can be an anti uh, only way you can find uh, i mean fight casteism is through anti to, in, is to be an anti casteist so th- there is to there are only binary options here that you are either a casteist and or you are an anti casteist but you can never be a not non casteist right so what does an anti casteist mean an anti casteist means that you become an ally and what does allyship entail allyship means you have to actively take on the left's position you have to go and 
be um, you have to be an activist you have to sever ties with in your own circles from these kinds of ideas so so suraj jangade encourages um, children to uh, or young adults to go sever ties with their parents because that's how you be an anti casteist um, and you join part of the left's um, advocacy in fighting these kinds of um, uh, casteist practices according to him so that is suraj jangade and then you of course have uh, ajanta subramanyam uh, who who wants to dismantle the iits so subramanyam uses critical race theory to formulate a thesis uh, with no data you know to support her wild claims her goal is to show that iits and other institutions of excellence in india are oppressive structures designed to propagate the subjugation of dalits and other marginalized communities by using merit as the criteria for success so there is a big attack on meritocracy we've come up with a book separately on that uh, which is called the battle uh, for the iits and we show there how merit is considered you know caste capital and merit is a sham and um, and the upper caste use merit to keep the dalits uh, and the other marginalized away from um, these kinds of eminent institutions and this is important because uh, you had the supreme court chief justice uh, justice chandrachud recently say that merit cannot be reduced to narrow definitions of performance in an open competitive examination which only provides formal equality of opportunity earlier i talked about how uh, the critical race theory talks about equality of outcome here is the justice who's talking about the same thing justice chandrachud talks about substantive equality versus formal equality which essentially means substantive equality means equality of outcome whereas formal equality means everybody is the same under the law and everybody has equal opportunity so justice chandrachud is now signaling that he is more interested in substantive equality which means equality of of outcome which essentially means we remove we redistribute Uh, resources marks whatever from those who have to those we think are who are marginalized and and distribute them that way and this is going to cause chaos um it's it's not enough for them to have um uh, quotas for entering the iits now they want to make sure that they're going to do away with the exams altogether because Uh, the outcomes are not equal so it's very important for us to understand these terms uh, um that uh, uh, that social sciences puts out because they affect us directly affect our children directly and affect the whole whole ecosystem now with ajanta subramanyam's work of dismantling uh, the iits and calling caste as a form of capital that the upper caste use and what so what they do is they go into the iits like currency you know you take rupees and convert it to dollars they have something called caste capital which they which they bring with them these upper caste devious people and they they use the iits to convert it and then they have and something called merit now which is more fungible that they can take abroad and go to america and act um, like they are also minorities but then use this merit to get ahead in society so there is the attack on the iits from an institutional level but there's also attacks on attacks on iit alumni who are very successful in the silicon valley and by calling them casteist and practicing um, uh, caste bias in hiring and this is evidenced by the case recent case of Cis- in cisco systems where a, a brahmin manager got uh got sued for being biased and by a um a dalit uh, worker of some sort um, he i think he worked under him and cisco essentially said that i don't think this was we don't think that this was a caste bias case but um the case is still on and the jury is out there so this has real impact on on our people as they enter college as they come out of college as they enter workplace and as they work in the workforce so it has real tangible uh, effect on people now there's also uh, this caste as a protected category is the latest uh, in america 
we had Seattle pass an ordinance saying that caste is a special protected category. You should understand that the civil, uh, uh, this, after the civil rights movement, you had equal law protecting everybody, so there should be no discrimination, and that is enough to protect um, all kinds of biases. So the minute you have a protected class, anybody can say, uh, or sue a, a person saying that I got fired or I, I got rejected on any account because of caste bias. And, and these kinds of discrimination take, are taken very, very seriously in the US. Seattle has passed it. Many of the universities have made caste a protected class. And many of the companies are doing the same. And this is all coming back to India because once the companies adopt it, they say a Microsoft adopts uh, uh, caste as a protected category, then it comes back to their offshore offices in Bangalore or wherever, and it gets um, applied uh, in India, on Indian soil, but um, critical race theory comes back to haunt you even over here. So, so my, my point is that, you know, we should take these social sciences very, very seriously and because it affects us and the time has come where it's affecting each and every one of us. Now, who's funding this research in Harvard? So you have the Mahindra Center for Humanities. So you have all these Indian billionaires who are making their money uh, on Indian soil and and they lend their names for these centers at Harvard, which is producing this kind of uh, caste, um, as a, a weaponizing caste in their, in their scholarship, so to say. So you have the Mahindra Center of Huma Humanities, you have the Lakshmi Mittal Center for South Asian Studies. In fact, the, um, the, uh, there's a professor by the name of Thomas Hansen, who is called the Dhirubhai Ambani, um, Reliance Dhirubhai Ambani Professor of Anthropology at Stanford. And this Professor Hansen was one of the key uh, pillars for the uh, breaking um, Hindutva, uh, dismantling global Hindutva conference which took place last year. So these uh, scholars of the West who are out to dismantle Hindutva and Hinduism are all funded by our Indian billionaires, which is um, which is very sad. Now, Harvard, uh, you know, th th I've mentioned uh, Mahindra and uh, Mittal, but there are so many others. They're just the anchor um, uh, donors. And with that, you have people like, um, uh, you know, the head of PTM has donated, Bajaj have donated, the Tatas have donated. Uh, so, so we just question, um, these kinds of donations. So we we say that we've done a civilizational audit, and it, the billionaire Indian billionaires have a right to fund these kinds of research. But we just want them to know that um, that this is what the output. Uh, that this kind of money is producing, that their money is producing under their family names, and is that is this what they want? And perhaps they do want this. Um, so, so the second part of the book, we talk about Harvard, and we talk about all the um, uh, you know this kind of atrocity literature that's coming out of uh, out of Harvard. The third part of the book, of course, it talks about India, and we look at. Uh, Kriya University, uh, Ashoka University, and some other, uh, uh, some other institutions and clubs like the Godrej Culture Labs and things like that. Now, if you look at uh, Kriya University, Kriya has a partnership with MIT, and one would think that a partnership with, with MIT would give, um, give us a space technology or, or uh, nanotechnology or something like that, given that the partner is MIT. But unfortunately, uh, M MIT is coming here to again bring in social science. Uh, the Saudis uh, have funded something called JPAL, Jameel uh, Poverty Action Lab at MIT. Saudi Arabia itself has one in four that is below the poverty line, and yet they want to solve the poverty of India, which is ironic. Now, the Saudis have funded JPAL, and JPAL has JPAL is an institution which is Poverty Action Lab and under MIT has a partnership with Kriya University, and of course they are looking at um, in the they are looking at social issues, especially caste. 
in the field of economics. So for example, there will be research on why Hindu women um, do not uh, like to work uh, once they have a family uh, because it's perhaps the Hindu men, uh, Hindu upper caste men are uh, patriarchs who forbid them from going to work and they probably are oppressed, even more oppressed than poor Muslim women. You know, there's, there, there, there is uh, research like that. And of course there is Bill Gates who funds this, who wants to change the behavior of, uh, of Hindu upper caste women who are refusing to go to work because they want to take care of their family. Uh, perhaps uh, he has never thought that maybe Hindu women uh, you know, have a choice and have made the choice to take care of their children. But he is working with Ashoka to change the behavior of Hindu women so that more of them can go to the workplace. Now, Kriya also is mining over you know, 10,000 villages of Tamil Nadu, data from there, and they meticulously mine this, and the repository of this data is in Yale University for their research. So there's a whole lot of data mining that's going on all over in, in many, many aspects. Some of them are government gives. So for example, Niti Aayog has a partnership with uh, Harvard for population studies. And uh, India has given a key database on the population to Harvard University. Now, if you look at that uh, population uh, studies dashboard where they represent India, Kashmir is actually whited out. Uh, this is India given the data to Harvard, they have a partnership and, and the map of India shows Kashmir whited out. And this is how Harvard looks at India. I don't know if our government also feels the same, but that's, um, you know, uh, an important database has been given to Harvard by the Niti Aayog. Niti Aayog also has many of um, Harvard experts who uh, who come and give advice. In fact, um, one of them gives, um, uh, you know, talks about how we have an open one window uh, to bring in um, foreign universities uh, to Indian soil so that they can open shop. And um, we have a single window so that they can quickly register and get started um, with the business of educating Indians in liberal arts. Now I'll come to that in a bit, but going back to Ashoka. So we studied uh, five departments in Ashoka. The first one is, I'm just gonna check the time, yeah. The first one is um, China Studies, where um, China uh, is, funding scholars through Harvard into Ashoka. Ashoka is the main conduit which, you know, which distributes this scholarship. They, China essentially wants to train Indian scholars on how they should think about China. So you have, um, uh, you have uh, Jadavpur University, Somaya College, Christ College, all these people who then send scholars through Ashoka into Harvard Yangqing Institute and then China trains them for a year on how Indian scholars should be studying China. So this is a national security issue as far as I'm concerned. And then you have the gender studies department and Ashoka proudly claims that you know, we are, we are the Harvard of India, as if it's something to be proud of, and, and says that, we, we, you know, Ashoka has the first one that not only has gender studies, but we also have gender and sexuality studies. So what does gender and sexuality mean? One would think that gender studies, sexuality studies talks about abstinence and sexual health and things like that, but it's nothing to do with all of that. It has to do with, um, how about bringing pornography into education? So they have these outside experts that bring in, um, that come up with these ideas saying that pornography um, should and must be a part of education. Um, and, they, and these are experts that are being supplied to the NCERT. Now, the other, thing, other experts they have are people who believe in uh, deviant sexual practices and how uh, young people should be exposed and should, should, should avail of these risky sexual behaviors because, because these 
the fact that we call them even deviant sexual practices is because of patriarchy. This is how critical race theory enters into the sexual domain. So who is to say that um, something is pleasurable and something is painful in sexual practice? This is an idea and a notion that is born of patriarchy and those that should be dismantled. And therefore, everything should be uh, it should be open and we should uh, take, we should uh, encourage our young people to, to embark into risky sexual behavior. So this, I'm not making this up, right? So, th so this is the sexual um, and gender studies and sexual, uh, sexuality studies at Ashoka. And the third very, very disturbing um, institute in Ashoka is called the Trivedi Center for Political Data. It's not even political science. It's Trivedi Center for Political Data. It's a pure data mining operation. So you would be surprised to know, again, a national security issue. This is funded by the French Ministry of External Affairs. The French Ministry of External Affairs is funding this Trivedi Institute of um, uh, Political Data. Now, what do they do? They have an ex-election commissioner, uh, Mr. Qureshi, whom, who, who is their chairman or whatever. And then you have Christophe Jaffrelot, who is a, you know, he's a renowned uh, Hindu-phobe. And he's one of the, again, uh, pillars of the dismantling Hindutva conference. And all they do is they collect data from every municipal panchayat election up to the, you know, uh, legislative elections. They, big and small, all election data they gather. They gather every candidate uh, that has stood, every, uh, the profile of every judge in every court, they you know how many languages they speak, um, what is the income, um, where do they live, all data. And it, this is all residing in some overseas uh, database in, in France and the University of Michigan. So the entire job of this Trivedi Institute of Political Data is to mine Indian data on, uh, on the polity. And, uh, they, they, and where there are no translations, if it's in, in the local language, they have, they have translated all of that as well so that uh, Western scholars can access them. Now this, you, you can easily create fault lines uh, in India and uh, that's probably why you see all these, you know, George Soros doing this or the BBC doing that. It's because these guys have this kind of a system um, that's going on. Now, there's another institute in Ashoka which is on, on philanthropy. Now, the, uh, the clampdown on the FCRA has made the uh, Western NGOs uh, extremely frustrated. Not that they don't have other means to do it, but it's made them frustrated. So, uh, Ashoka's uh, philanthropy department, right, they, they are the consultants, if you will, that help these foreign NGOs navigate the new FCRA rules. So one of the concerns that they have is how do you make Indian don the Indian donor give more? So in the world of philosophy, philanthropy, you have, you have um, uh, two aspects, right? One is called rights, uh, philanthropy for, you know, rights-based and advocacy-based philanthropy. And the other phil kind of philanthropy is essentially for services. And it, apparently it seems that apparently the Indian, the average Indian donor is more concerned about services, which means healthcare, education, food. And what, what is concerning for Ashoka is how do you convert this Indian donor that gives to services, you know, of, med, of healthcare, education and food to make them more advocacy oriented? What should we do? How can we change their behavior? And how do we reduce the risk? So this is the kind of um, uh, consulting that they're doing to Oxfam and Amnesty International and, and uh, big NGOs. How do you change the behavior of the Indian donor? Now, 
one of the things they come up with is they say that Indian donors are perhaps not going into advocacy and human rights and all of that because they're a little afraid, uh, you know, it's, a, it's too risky to be, you know, political, so they'd rather stick with, you know, building toilets and, and giving medicine. So one way to mitigate that risk is to have them pool their resources together. So if you're just one rich guy funding advocacy, you stand out like a sore thumb. And so instead what they do is you, you encourage your friends. And you can see that model Im implemented in this I IPSMF, which is, you guys are in the media, you should know that, uh, which is started by Azim Premji. Uh, Azim Premji started this, um, I forget the full thing, it's to fund media companies. And uh, so you have Kiran um, Shaw and all the, who's who is over there. Yeah, all the big guys, all the Indian big billionaires have formed a cooperative sort of uh, um, institute. And then they pool their funds together. Time. Yeah, they pool their funds together and they, um, and they fund, um, you know, media companies. So this is the state of, my time is up. So this is the state of uh, affairs which Subramanya Bharati would be like deeply, deeply, um, you know, uh, sad. Uh, and we should do something about it. I can go on about it. So it's the snakes in the Ganga essentially talks about these, um, these problems. The part four of it, of course, talks about where all this is leading to. And there are global forces um, like the World Economic Forum and the UN, and, um, which are essentially the mouthpieces for the billionaires, you know, for them to take over um, our lives, the corporations, and, and the country. So the fault lines are, are there. They are deepening unless we wake up. So with that, I will close. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your insightful speech on your book. Now I request Prafulya Ketkar to come over the stage and felicitate Srimati Vijaya Vishwanathan.